Blog Talk Radio. This time, I'm going to give it to them. Today on Mr. Media, I'll talk to legendary comic book artist and illustrator Jerry Robinson, subject of a new career retrospective and biography by N.C. Christopher Couch, Jerry Robinson, Ambassador of Comics. Stick around. Hey, did you know that you can listen to the latest Mr. Media show right on your phone with the Stitcher app? Stitcher's smart radio for your smartphone. Mr. Media is on demand and on the go with Stitcher. Download Stitcher for your phone today. Get the free app at www.stitcher.com. That's S-T-I-T-C-H-E-R.com. So much media. So little time. Who keeps track of it all? That would be me. This is Bob Andelman, and this is a Mr. Media interview. You know, MrMedia.com, MRMedia.com. Stop by and check it out. There are more than 600 archived celebrity interviews for your listening pleasure. The show is brought to you today by the PartyAuthority.us. Planning a wedding, mitzvah, or corporate event in the New York, New Jersey, or Pennsylvania area? For any and all occasions, call the Party Authority nationwide at 1-800-DIAL-DJs. That's 1-800-342-5357, where one call does it all. Mr. Media is recorded live before a studio audience of cackling hyenas in white face and bright red Maybelline lipstick right here in the new new media capital of the world, St. Petersburg, Florida. Starting tonight, people will die. I'm the man of my word. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that Heath Ledger. Um, for many years, Jerry Robinson was one of the forgotten men in comics. Little known outside the industry for all the years he toiled in obscurity, drawing and creating Batman comic books under the byline of the character's creator, Bob Kane, Robinson emerged from the shadows to become a celebrated and recognized talent in his own right. He's perhaps best known now as the actual creator of the greatest supervillain ever, the Joker, and Batman's cheery sidekick, Robin the Boy Wonder. But unlike many men who spent their entire careers in the comics, Robinson's work branched out over time to fine illustration. He did commercial work on Broadway, for example, as well as contributing to books and magazines. And he did his own uh, comic strips. One of the surprising things we learn about Robinson is his compassion for fellow artists here in the United States and around the world, many of whom struggle against much greater political issues than whether a superhero's cape should be red or blue. Along the way, he developed a point of view of a world larger and more real and is found in the studios and minds of many American artists. He and Neil Adams, for example, banged the drum loudest in the mid-1970s for Jerry Siegel and Joe Schuster to be fairly compensating for creating Superman back in 1938. That led Robinson to support a number of artists struggling around the world, including Uruguay's imprisoned editorial cartoonist Francisco Lorenzo Pong. Robinson is today the subject of a new book by N.C. Christopher Couch, Chris, as most of us know him, that looks at the entire scope of Jerry's career and reproduces a wide array of his life's work. Jerry Robinson, Ambassador of Comics, also features an introduction by hard-boiled journalist and lifelong comics fan Pete Hamill, as well as a forward by the guiding hand behind much of the modern Batman stories, Dennis O'Neill. This is my second formal interview with Jerry. I also spoke to him several years ago for my biography, Will Eisner, A Spirited Life. He and Eisner were longtime contemporaries and members of a mutual appreciation society. Eisner and Bob Kane, if you didn't know it, grew up together, went to high school together, frequently double-gated, and were quite competitive with the young ladies back in the mid-30s. Jerry Robinson, welcome to Mr. Media. Hello. Hey, Jerry, how are you? Yeah, okay, Bob, fine. Good to talk to you again. Good to talk to you. <laughs> hey, uh, congratulations on the book. Nice uh, achievement. Thank you very much. Yeah, uh, Abrams did a beautiful production job and very careful care of uh, high resolution res- uh, images of all the all my work. So it's uh, very satisfying. They do do good works. Um, tell tell folks a little bit about the uh, the subtitle of the book, Ambassador of Comics. Well, <laughs> that was the publisher's uh, uh, title. Uh, uh, it's very flattering. I don't know if I'm 
entirely Bachelor of Economics, but I guess it's based on my travels, uh, some 45 countries, and uh, bringing exhibitions of American cartoon art to uh, such disparate places as Russia and Moscow and uh, China and Japan, South America, um, and all over Europe. So I've uh, and I've uh, started this cartoonist and writer syndicate. 1978, where we represent the leading cartoonists from around the world uh, in each country. And uh, my idea was uh, to have them known outside of their their own country, and they were never published in the United States before. So that's been a, a big uh, goal of mine, uh, international cartooning. So I guess that's how they came to that particular name. Uh, let me be the, uh, if you don't mind, the Joker's advocate in this for a second. Why do, uh, why would an American audience uh, be interested in the um, views of editorial cartoonists mm-hmm. from around the world? Mm-hmm. Oh, that's an excellent question, because that was what I was first asked by uh, when I first published the work. I did a book called The Best Cartoons of the Decade, which ran from, uh, which was the uh, 70s actually, and. Uh, uh, first, the publisher, McGraw-Hill, said uh, they were afraid they wouldn't be able to sell the book because uh, it contained work of foreign cartoonists who weren't known here. So um, my argument was that they're not known here because they were, haven't been published. But I knew that they were the work of great artists and great graphic artists and uh, astute politicians in their own right. So... Uh, I finally convinced them to uh, I wouldn't do the book unless it contained half foreign cartoonist and half American. So they did this with much trepidation, but uh, they published it, and lo and behold, uh, it was wonderfully reviewed, and most of the reviewers said how uh, interesting it was to see this work from around the world that they had never had a chance to see before, and too bad they weren't published more often. So... Uh, that settled the matter in my mind that this was the right time uh, with the right product, uh, that the world was getting smaller. I thought it was very important for American readers to see what the political opinion was that they were reading abroad. And uh, I just had to find a format for it because they wouldn't publish the work of any one cartoonist because the readers would say, why, why print the word of work of Plantu, for example, who appeared on the front page of Le Monde every day in Paris. Um, but if I could put together a, a, a roundup of cartoonists showing different points of view from different countries each week, uh, that would be viable and that would be a great service for the, to the readers. So and that's, that's what I set out to do, and it took me a couple of years to put together the cartoonists that I already known from abroad and add others and settle on the format, send out the uh, promo of the, announcing the new feature and what it looked like. And that took a couple of years, and then you sit back and wait for the reviews, just like a, a Broadway play. Mm-hmm. And uh, fortunately, the, the papers responded. The next day, I got a call from the L.A. Times. They wanted to subscribe right away. I knew we had uh, were on to something. And uh, so from there on, we grew from about 20 artists to begin with in uh, 20 countries. Uh, now we represent over 350 artists in some 50 countries. And that's distributed every day and every week on our website and to our subscribers. If you'd like to take a look at them, you can see it at nytimages.com. Hmm. And Jerry, did you approach this as an art project or a political project? Well, it was really my interest in political cartooning. At that time, I was a political cartoonist myself. Actually, most of my career has been as a political cartoonist. I did a daily uh, political social satire for 32 years, one every day, six days a week. Mm -hmm. So uh, most of my career has been involved with political cartooning, So, particularly at that time in the 70s. And, um, you know, do, do uh, editorial cartoonists around the world uh, approach their craft the same way that, that the Americans do in terms of American cartoonists? And, and I've had, for example, uh, Clay Bennett, who's a Pulitzer Prize winning cartoonist mm-hmm. on the show, 
uh, his, you know, with him, it's it's always about tweaking the establishment. Uh, mm-hmm. You know, it's usually one side or another, mm-hmm. but tweaking the the hypocrisy and that type of thing. Yeah. Is, is it yeah. the same around the world? Uh, no, not really. I think a lot of the countries uh, and areas have their own traditions. Um, our tradition mostly has been visual and political cartoon. Um, I think only in more recent years has a uh, cap um, dialogue or or additional um, written material been incorporated in the cartoon. Um, hmm. In Europe, uh, they've been the countries are so intertwined and uh, so have multiple languages is much more common. So they do use more integrate more uh, dialogue in their cartoons. Um, than we normally have in political cartoons. They're also, uh, I think, um, for the most part, more pro-cartoon. In other words, they're they're extolling some virtue. And, of course, some of it came from the countries with censorship. Obviously, they had Mm -hmm. to uh, restrain their comments and uh, be more in line with the the ruling class in in that country. Whereas here, it's most been less pol- polemical and, uh, and and more in this, uh, seeking out uh, uh, flaws in a policy. Uh, you know, you I think say some cartoonists say that if they don't uh, if they don't create an enemy uh, any, every day somewhere, why they're not doing their job. <laughs> now, Jerry, I have to ask you. You say that it's less polemical here, but. Um, I'm thinking that in the, the days, weeks, months, even years after 9-11, yeah. that a lot of political cartoonists felt pressure not to criticize uh, mm-hmm. the ruling class and, and mm-hmm. the way things were. Mm-hmm. Well, that was in a, in a period of euphoria and it is a, and a tragedy when we're all pulling together. And I don't think that's indicative of the average political cartoon. Mm. Has, that, has, that, has the pendulum... Uh, swung back on that? Do, do you think? Well, that... certainly it has. I mean, you can see it, the uh, <clears throat> the nature of the political uh, campaigns themselves have become more and more uh, vicious, more and more attack mode, uh, attack ads, and negative ads. Uh, and that's so. Uh, the, uh, most papers now have their own political view, and most of the political cartoonists. Uh, except for the very top ones, conform to their papers' uh, political po- uh, editorial policy. Uh, mm. But on the other hand, m- uh, many of the cartoons find find the, their niche and with the with the papers that they mostly agree with, and mm. uh, that's basically how how the work is sifted out between the cartoonists and the paper. Um, I just want to ask you one more you know, thing. The, about, I might about add this. one thing. Yeah. You know, the editorial cartoon is really like a column. You know, you sign the cartoonists are signing that cartoon, so it represents mm-hmm. their view, and uh, uh, and uh, uh, the cartoonists are very uh, um, jealous of that of, of that prerogative, and so it is like a visual column reflecting the view of that artist, uh, just as. Uh, the editorial writer might write the editorial cartoon for that paper. He might have some of his own views and inject them, but uh, uh, they don't necessarily have to conform 100% with the paper. Hmm. Well, I wanted to ask you one more thing about that, and then we'll, sure. we'll, we'll, we'll take a quick break and come back and talk about the thing for which you're best known, uh, the Batman, the Joker. But um, mm-hmm. there, there came a point in, in the 70s where... Um, Jules Pfeiffer saw your help and, and told mm-hmm. you about the case of uh, Francisco Lorenzo Pons. Yes. Did you ever hesitate, even momentarily, to stick your, I was going to say toe, into such <laughs> a volatile part of it, more like sticking your neck out in some yeah, way? Well, neck was more appropriate. No, I didn't. I I, uh, well, I had been working for human rights a long time. I, I uh, was uh, commissioned by the UN to produce a show on human rights for the biggest conference on human rights ever held in, in uh, Vienna about 19, um, what was it, uh, 93, I believe. And uh, 
And before that, I did other exhibitions with you and on on the environment and others. So when they when Jules told me about that, I uh, I was just in the position of doing something. I, that year, I was pr president of the National Cartoonist Society, and uh, I thought, you know, there he was thrown in jail for opposing the regime. This was in Uruguay in the 70s, the worst uh, political uh, um, fascist regime in South America at the time. So I spoke to him. Uh, and after Jules briefed me on the case, I spoke to uh, Amnesty. They assured me he was not a bomb thrower. He didn't kill anyone. He opposed their regime in uh, Uruguay at the time, uh, just with his pen and and his writing and his drawing. So I thought, uh, you know, there, but for the grace of God, could be one of uh, American cartoonists uh, who, uh, you know, that could have happened to them in their country. So I thought it was something we should try to uh, to help. And um, so I called all my board members around the country uh, in the various cities where they were and to uh, sign this joint declaration of our of our support for him and he was we then uh, were in contact with the representatives of uh, of uh, Lorenzo and they told us the condition he was actually jailed and tortured terribly you know in those regimes it's uh, uh, you can be a murderer and be treated better than somebody who is opposing their regime you know mm -hmm. physically and so uh, terribly tortured we held some uh, fundraising so then we through some devious channels we got money to his family he had a small child and they became non persons once their uh, once the head of the family was in jail for political reasons and uh, then we set aside to get articles about him planted in the papers I, I met with the Washington Post the New York Times I called artists abroad that I knew both in the, um, South America and in Europe they printed articles. So it was a long campaign and uh, finally met at the White House. I was aided in that, by the way, by my successor president. Uh, I was also president of the editorial cartoonists. And mm -hmm. I must say now that they they were one of the, uh, the chief supporters. Uh, I think I might have misspoke and said president at the time of the, edit of, uh, the National Cartoonist Society. It was the Association of Editorial Cartoonists. And my successor as president was Sandy Campbell of the Nashville, Tennessee. And so the effort spanned both of our terms. And Sandy and I went to uh, the White House. We met with Meese right next to the president's office. We met with the uh, um, human rights, um, the, I don't know his title was uh, officer in charge of human rights in the State Department which was uh, Abrams, uh, who later went to jail in a scandal. And uh, none of those places helped, by the way. They did just the opposite. Um, so happened I knew uh, Senator Sangas at the time, who unfortunately since passed on, of Massachusetts, a very fine liberal senator. And he took up the cause right away. And just by the serendipity, uh, uh, my son was just on the summer off from uh, law school, he was going to Northwestern and got a job at Senator Sangas uh, as an intern for that summer. And Sangas called him in the office not knowing he was my son just to get uh, to take this statement that he wrote out protesting that imp imprisonment uh, of Lorenzo around to other senators to, to sign that same proclamation. And which he did, and he got we got bipartisan support. I remember at the time, Senator Baker, a lead Republican senator, uh, Senator Kennedy, Ted Kennedy, and uh, uh, oh, so many others. I think we had about 20 signatories to that petition to free him. Yeah. And then uh, it's kind of long story short, it finally resulted in we are meeting at the Ukrainian ambassador, Sandy Campbell, and myself, and they agreed to release the. Lorenzo's wife for one week to come up to a convention that we we're holding, and I had made up a, uh, a uh, actually a, a phony award just to get him out 
hopefully to get him out to receive it, uh, this most distinguished foreign cartoonist award. Well, they never let a uh, they would never let him out of the country. They knew he'd come back, and they never actually let the family out because figuring they'd never come back. But they did in Lorenzo's case. And his wife came up to receive the award on behalf. So we didn't succeed in getting him out, but we did get his wife out for her. But she went back. She wouldn't leave the country without her without yeah. her uh, husband. But she and her son did come up for a week. And But after that, they stopped torturing him. They knew the main thing in helping these prisoners is, is to let them know that the world knows about them, that there's people outside who are working to free them, that they have some hope. When they give up hope, they, they health deteriorates, they die, or they'll commit suicide. Mm. Well, Jerry, it almost seems mundane to switch from uh, political freedom uh, and torture to the Batman, but I know a lot of people <laughs> tuning in will want to know about this. Yeah. Um, can you uh, can you briefly recount how you met Bob Kane and came to be the artist on Batman uh, just two months into its run? Yeah, well, again, I guess so much of my life has been serendipitous because uh, I sold, uh, I was 17, I graduated high school and sold ice cream on a, on a bicycle with pulling a cart behind me. Uh, that summer to earn enough money for my first semester of college. And uh, by the end of the summer, near the end, I, my mother was afraid I wouldn't survive because I was on a 98-pound track team, I think, after selling ice cream all summer, <laughs> pulling the car to the bicycle. I was down to about 78 pounds. So she persuaded me to take $25, of my hard-earned money, and go up in the country to fatten up. She didn't think I'd survive the first semester in college. Which I did, and uh, and the first day out, I was on the tennis team, and I said, tennis is my lifelong passion. And I ran out, and I wore a jacket that we in high school uh, used as, um, it was kind of the fan at the time. It was a college fan. I was born in Trenton, New Jersey, near Princeton, and I knew all the college kids, and that's where I think we got the idea of wearing these painter's jackets that were decorated with our own graffiti of the time. So I decorated mine with cartoons. I did draw cartoons for the school papers, cartoonist and as an editor. And uh, so I wore this jacket out as a warm-up jacket to the tennis court. And I was looking for a partner that very first day, and I feel a tap on my shoulder. I did, barely turned around and saying, who did those cartoons on your jacket? And I thought I was going to be arrested or so. And, uh, he said, no, they're, they're pretty good. Uh, and he introduced himself as Bob Kane. He had just finished Batman, the first issue, and was likewise taking a vacation. So how we met up at that, he didn't play tennis. He just happened to be walking by the court and spot, spotted my uh, jacket with cartoons. If I had come out a, an hour later or came a day later or whatever, uh, that probably would never have happened. So he offered me a job immediately. He said, I just started this feature. We need help on the feature. Uh, there was just the writer, Bill Finger, and himself. And I had been fortunately accepted in three colleges. I intended to be a journalist and, I'm, and a writer, which I have been able to do for the rest of my career as well. But so, but at that time, I had no idea of being an artist, a commercial artist, or a professional artist. And so I it was accepted in Columbia, Syracuse, and Penn. And for some reason, I just for no good reason other than it sounded more like a small-town college, I decided to go to Syracuse rather than New York, to Columbia. He said, well, too bad if you didn't come to, if you came to Columbia, you could start on Batman. So I immediately called from the from the resort to Columbia to see if my uh, application was still good, and fortunately it was. I called Syracuse and told them I was not coming, and I called home and said, I'm going to New York. I went right from that mountains directly to New York. <laughs> the only other little thing I had to that story was that uh, I couldn't, I didn't know how to get to New York. I'd never been there before uh, <laughs> from the mountains. And it gave me complicated bus connections. And But then the manager said, well, you know, Jan Pierce, who was uh, one of the greatest um, tenors at Metropolitan Opera, had given a concert there that weekend. And uh, he was just going back to New York. So the manager said, maybe Mr. Pierce might give you a ride in. <laughs> so I timidly went up to the great man and asked if I 
and possibly get a ride in, and the manager said you might. He said, oh, sure, kid, stop in, and a big limousine drove up with his chauffeur <laughs> in the back seat with Jan Pierce, and that's how I, that was my interest in New York. We got wow. as far as the Bronx, and they kicked me out. <laughs> wow. Well, I'm, I'm, I want to try to ask you this before we run out of time. Did, yeah. Uh, it was you and Bill Finger who basically did all the work uh, and toiled in obscurity while Bob Kane made the dough, he got the girls, and pretended to do the work while he was out gallivanting, from all I've heard. <laughs> at, what point did, at what point did that start to bother you guys? Well, I, I guess it bo- always bothers me, but it's bothers us, but it seemed to be the tradition that the creator... Well, Bob had gone down and signed the contract, unknown to Bill and myself, uh, uh, for for Batman. And uh, we just accepted that we, yeah, I was only 17. I was too naive to know anything about artist rights or creator rights. And neither did Bill. Bill was a shoe salesman and, and trying to break in the writing field, a very few connections before. And uh, so we didn't know uh, enough to protect our rights. At the time, so we finally, Bill and I decided to leave because we had been getting offers from all over the other, all the other publishers, who wanted anybody who had connection with the success of Batman. And uh, when as soon as our publishers heard about it, they immediately contacted us directly and and uh, signed a contract with us to work directly with DC, and uh, rather than Bob. So then I began to do all the. Covers of my own stories complete and so forth, as did Bill, Bill where we worked directly for, for DC rather than Bob. So that's the story in a nutshell. All right. And then last question, and then yeah. we, we'll, we're going to run out of time. Tell me, if you can, in, in, in a moment or two, uh, yeah. about the creation of the Joker. I can't okay. let you go without asking about that. Okay. Well, um, the Joker came about uh, the next year. Uh, Batman became so, so successful, the publisher immediately set a, a schedule for Batman number one. It had been appearing just once a month in Detective Comics. So they slated Batman number one for the spring, which would contain four new stories. So all of a sudden, Bill and the rest, and the, from the art standpoint, we had to turn out five stories in the time we normally spend on one. And, uh, so Bill was a, undoubtedly the best writer. He should have been co-creator of, of, of Batman. I was mm-hmm. there and I saw he he came up with all the uh, mythos of Batman, the backstory, all the other characters. And uh, but unfortunately, it was not. But uh, so, but he was a very uh, uh, slow craftsman. Uh, all the stories were very well craftsman and, uh, and plotted and. Uh, so he was confronted with turning out those five stories all at once, which was very different. So I immediately volunteered to do one of the stories. Uh, as I was still going to college, I was just splitting my time between Batman and, and Columbia, and I was down to uh, the raw edge by that time, burning <laughs> candle at both ends. And uh, But they, they knew that I, my intent was to be a writer, and I had shown them my stories that I had been, written, been writing in my creative life writing class, so they were both delighted to, for me to do a story and relieve Bill of one one of the stories out of the four, at least. So I went home that night, and my first thought was, uh, um, you know, we were, that period was uh, just coming out of depression. Uh, it was the era of the gangster, the bootlegger, the Al Capones, the pretty boy Floyd, John Dillinger. Those were the usual pattern for our villains in the comics. Except once in a while we'd have a mad scientist, maybe. <laughs> uh, but there were no super heroes, no super villains. Uh, in fact, the word wasn't even a, a coin at the time. But I knew from my studies of literature and college that all, and before that I was an avid reader, that all great uh, uh, heroes had a protagonist. And, uh, you know, dating from the Bible and David and Goliath to Sherlock Holmes and Moriarty and so forth. So I first thought of coming up for my story first with a villain that was worthy of Batman, worthy to test him. And uh, there was a dichotomy at the time that some thought that if he made the hero, uh, rather the villain, too strong, it would overpower the hero. 
and that wouldn't be as good story-wise. Well, I felt just the opposite, and uh, we finally agreed on that. And uh, so my, I set out to create a villain, and I guess everything in your life fits in somehow. And uh, in my case, a lot of the stories I had written for uh, my classes were sat- satire and the short story form, which was my favorite. I loved the, the Maupassant and, and O. Henry and, and uh, Turgenev and so forth. And so um, uh, I thought of uh, uh, creating the villain first. And uh, as I had written humor a lot, the next, best, the next important thing is the name, a proper name for the character that reflects something of his, his persona. And so I immediately thought of the Joker uh, as a name for my villain. And I knew all villains have a... Uh, good villains have a contradiction in their character. I should have mentioned this first in my reasoning. <laughs> and uh, so a villain with a sense of humor uh, would be different. And uh, so when I came to that idea, my villain would, would have some, some uh, sense of humor about him, some ironic touch. Uh, then I thought of the Joker, and that immediately led to my visualizing the Joker playing card, because fa- uh, the playing cards was a big part of my family. Uh, I had a, one of my elder brothers was a champion contract bridge player. He won te- 17 tournaments in the world in the world <laughs> row. Um, that's where you got master points, like a chess champion chess players. And so there were always my mother was a very fine player also. So I was just fair, but I loved the game. And so there was usually a uh, deck of cards around. And I frantically looked that very night for the image of the Joker. And the playing card deck I had had that iconic Joker uh, image. And mm-hmm. it was a fortunate choice because the Joker goes back in history. It's, uh, it played a part in the medieval life and, and Shakespearean works. Uh, the Joker was an itinerant storyteller. Uh, so it had a built-in feeling, and also uh, the Joker, is a, as a clown, uh, which he is as a jester, uh, has a cutting edge to it. And many children are afraid of the image of the clown, and even adults. It, the clown image has a certain edge to it, and uh, those that are really afraid of clowns, uh, there's even a phobia. Uh, cultural phobia has uh, named it for that for that fear of clowns. So yeah. the Joker had that kind of uh, edgy quality to begin with, and I think that has a lot to do with his with the uh, emotion that he arises and his his um, uh, longevity. I think has to do with that. Hmm. Well, it's. It's a it's a shame that we have to end there, but it's wonderful to talk to you. And folks, uh, you can find this terrific new book, Jerry Robinson, Ambassador of Comics, by NC Christopher Couch, Chris Couch, in great bookstores everywhere. Or you can order it right now online at mrmedia.com. Well, thanks for the plug, Bob. Uh, could I My add pleasure. one more thing? Do you have time? Of course. Of course. Uh, I am um, just involved in. in in a, a very unusual auction. I don't know if you know, I had saved some of the most iconic pieces of art from the gold, so-called golden age of comics from 39 to 50. And uh, I couldn't bear to see the, these pieces that, uh, that I admired so much done by my colleagues and a few of my own that I wanted to save from destruction. They publishers routinely, uh, after the the art was shot by the engraver, they were re- routinely torn up and destroyed. And nobody thought of any value of the original art. Mm. And I, nor did I, uh, but I didn't want to see, I couldn't see them destroyed, so I would ask the engraver to, before they destroyed the cover that I particularly liked to, to save, to send it back with a, when they made the next pickup. Every, almost every day they would pick up art that we would do for, for the next issues. And uh, so I managed to sal- salvage uh, some of the most, what's now considered the most historic and iconic art of that time. And uh, mm. now I, 
uh, where we used to pin them on the wall and, uh, and with that no thought of how valuable they were. I have to keep them in a vault now. But they are now going to go on, on um, the next auction by Comic Connect. Comic Connect. And I guess you can see them on the on the uh, on their uh, website. And the Superman, hmm. one of them is Superman 14, which is considered the most uh, iconic Superman cover uh, ever, I think. Uh, and it was the height of the war. 19, it was done in 1942 by Fred Ray, who worked right next to me, as did see, as did Joe Schuster on the other side, and Jack Kirby was mm-hmm. a very good uh, yeah. open. And so it's number 14. It's the one with the. Um, Superman standing with his shield and the eagle on his shoulder. I suspected and, that was it, yeah. Yeah, you know, and uh, the other one was uh, one of my first Joker covers, uh, number 69, I believe, for the affectionados who know those things. Um, <laughs> the big Joker, and it's the only time he was shown with guns. It's the, I think it's known as the two-gun or the Aladdin, uh, the Aladdin cover. Joker is... <laughs> is uh, peering out of the Aladdin's lamp holding two guns was the only time we showed him with guns after that. The editorial policy was not. But that turned out to be one of the most historic and largest images of uh, the Joker at the time. And that was also done in uh, 1942, so I was just 20 years old at that time. And so those two covers are going off for auction uh, shortly this coming month. And after okay, protecting actually, them for 70, I've protected them for 70 years, but I'm getting to the age where I think they, they have to go to other hands. And unfortunately, so, uh, I have to part with them. People can, people can find these uh, auction items at uh, comicconnect.com. Is that correct? That's correct, right. Okay. And, I'm, uh, I'm looking at the site now. Uh, right. and we'll, uh, we'll, we'll post the, uh, the URL, the, at, the online address, uh, oh, at right. mrmedia.com. Uh-huh. Yeah, and they can see them in the in the history of them, and uh, it's uh, I, I understand already the the uh, it's being flooded all over the country. That a lot of people are amazed that they were even existent anymore. So they are the <laughs> oldest existing classic covers, and it was just as I said in the other story, everything was kind of serendipitous. I just happened to be there. Those couple of years on the staff at D.C. before I moved to my, found my own studio, that I was there in a position to salvage and save those particular covers. I shudder to think of all those great pieces that were destroyed at the time and not think oh, absolutely. of the artistic value. So now I'm happy to say these pieces are being shown. I just, these are, have been on tour the last couple of years, by the way, and appeared in museums in uh, Atlanta, where it opened, and Detroit, Cleveland, um, and Los Angeles just closed. So the, there is a great appreciation now of of uh, them as really an indigenous American art form. And uh, mm-hmm. I think you'll be seeing them hang in museums. Uh, after all, Lichtenstein and Warhol and Ramos, all those who, who uh, adapted the comics in their own imagery and uh, that were worth uh, value to millions of dollars and here the images that they took them from uh, are not in the museums where I think they they should be protected and appreciated. Mm-hmm. All right. Well, folks, so, so you can check the comicconnect.com. Uh, these will be auctioned and many more items there. And uh, Jerry Robinson, uh, great to talk to you. Uh, well, thanks stay so much, Bob. It's good to talk to you and your audience. Stay healthy, and uh, thanks for joining us on Mr. Media today. Sure, my pleasure. All right, take care. All right, ciao. Bye-bye. And for more original interviews with your favorite comic book and comic strip creators, surf over to our main website, mrmedia.com, mrmedia.com. Please take advantage of this great offer for Mr. Media radio listeners. Go to audiblepodcast.com slash mrmedia to get a free audiobook download of your choice when you sign up today. Again, that's audiblepodcast.com slash mrmedia for your free audiobook. Subscribe to Mr. Media on iTunes and you'll never miss a show. 
Just search Mr. Media Interviews from within iTunes and subscribe for free. If you've got an idea for a guest, email me directly at bob at mrmedia.com, mrmedia.com. You can also follow me on Facebook or on Twitter, twitter.com slash Andelman, or on Facebook, just search Mr. Media Interviews. Thanks so much for joining us today. Always appreciate you giving up a little piece of your day and spending it with us. Thanks for listening, everybody. Tune in tomorrow. Same bat time.